Now, as he sat on Mount Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming, the second coming of the Lord in times, last days, and the end of the age. You know what? How many of you recognize that when you're driving down a highway, it is very important that you understand how to read a sign? It could be life-threatening if you don't see rocks falling, reduced speed, dead man's curves, animal crossing. And if you ignore those signs, what's going to happen? How many of you are football fans? That quarterback will get, get behind the center and he'll yell out numbers. 44, 83. We, the defense, and we don't know what they mean, but there's signs to those players. The guard is, bas- is, is going down the basketball court holding up a finger. That finger is a sign to those players, right? Anybody hear what I'm talking about? The, in baseball, in baseball, the catcher is holding a finger between his legs. That pitcher knows what that sign is. The third bait coach is going. <laughs> the, the players know. The players know what that is. That's a sign. And it's amazing to me that people, not not in this church because you're so well taught, but in the world and in other churches are just simply overwhelmed by what's going on in the world. And yet Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, sat down with his disciples and said this, I'm going to tell you what signs of the last day looks like. Now, I'm not telling you this for you to be scared. I'm telling you to ready yourself to be the light and be the salt and be strong in the Lord and narrow have a great narrative through what is going on and not to be, here's the word. Matthew 24, verse number four, he'll say it four times. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive not a few, but many. Then false prophets will rise up and again deceive many. Verse 24, false Christ, false prophets, false leaders will rise and show great signs and wonders. They will have personality, they will have charisma, they will have style and profile. It doesn't say that, but I added that. And it says, if, watch this, this is most important. If possible, They will deceive even the elect. Who is the elect? You and I, the church. That's how powerful in these last days deception will be. In all cultures, in all societies, in all positions, in all places of authority, of influence, deception will run rampant. Now to understand this amongst famines and pestilence and what, what Matthew 24 says, Deception is number one. It leads out of all the other ones. Before he gets into wars and famines and and antichrist and lawlessness, he says the number one sign of my second coming, that you are living in the last days and my soon return, is deception. I think because deception runs through all those things and he doesn't want us to be deceived. Deception is to be fooled to be tricked, to be beguiled, to be led astray, or to wander away. How many of you have ever been ripped off in your life? Okay, how many of you could say that was the best experience you ever had? It was such a blessing, it was so wonderful. I can't wait to get ripped off again. But that's what deception is. It's the way the devil is going to rip you off. He's going to rip you off. So he's going to try to sell you on oak when it's really veneer. See, but if you don't know what oak wood looks like, you'll think that you got oak wood, but you really got veneer. He's trying to sell you on a cubit zirconium and tell you it's a diamond. Now, ladies, wives, don't look at your, don't ever ask your husbands how much he spent on that, okay? That's a private thing. It's a, we're not into materialism. Maybe the 25th anniversary, you could boost it up and you can take him to the jewelry store and pick it out and make sure you get the real one this time. But anyway, sorry, moving on. 
See, the devil is going to try to sell you on a cubit zirconian telling you it's a diamond. But if you don't know what a real diamond looks like, smells like, feels like, you'll be deceived by the cubit zirconian. He will try to sell you on pyrite and tell you it's gold. That's called fool's gold. He'll try to do that. He'll try to sell you on a Rolex when it ain't really a Rolex. It's a Rolodex. <laughs> He'll try to sell you that this is Louis Vuitton when it's Louis Vuitton. But if you don't know what Louis Vuitton, man, you're telling your girlfriend, girl, I just bought a, a Louis Vuitton, a Louis Vuitton, I mean, and I spent $150, and your girlfriend will slap you and say, there ain't no Louis Vuitton on this planet that costs $150. I'm trying to draw an image to you today of how deception works. So, I'm a pretty smart guy. I go to Home Depot. I ain't mind, I'm minding my business, ain't bothering anybody. I come out of Home Depot, and I see a man in a suit walking toward me, wondering what he's going to say to me. He has a heavy Italian accent, heavy Italian accent. Now, I'm going to try to mimic him for a moment, so if I offend you, uh, uh, Italians don't get offended because my accent will move to Asian, to Mexican. It'll just move all over while I'm telling the story. He said, oh, how are you, my, my friend? How are you? My name is Gino. I came over from the county fair, and, and I got all these coats, uh, suede and, and leather, and I'm about ready to show me the ticket. Go to LAX, and sh I don't want to ship all my jackets back because then I got to pay fee. I make a, you a deal. How about you come on over to the van? <laughs> Remember what I said, cubit zirconium. Remember what I said, Louis Vinton. So I, I pretend like I'm smart, I ain't got time. Okay, I'll come on over there and look at them. And my eyes are like bug eyes because I'm, I've never had a suede jacket. Back then, I never had a leather jacket. He said, I make a, you a deal. Anything you, you want to hear, I make a, you a deal. So my mind's going 1,000 miles an hour. I don't have any cash. So I say, excuse me. And I walk over, I pick up the phone, I say, Cindy, that's my wife. I say, Cindy, whatever you, run to the ATM right now, get me some money, and get down here as fast as you can. She drove up like she was on a, a, a patrol car pursuit, and, and, and she, she didn't even stop. She rolled down the window, she threw out the money, and said, don't call me if you get arrested, and she drove off. <laughs> True story. So now I go over, he don't know how much money I got in my pocket. I say, uh, how much you uh, sell me if I get a few of them? He said, I make a, you a good deal. I make a, you a good. These uh, jackets are $500 to $1,000. Told you my accent's changing now. So can you see how it changed on you? <laughs> but I make a, you a deal today. I make a, you a good deal. I say, here's what I want. I want five jackets, and I'm going to give you $150. $150? You killing me. You killing me. My people, my mama got to be fed. My daughter got to be fed. My wife got to be fed. I said, bro, that's all I got, $150. He said, give me the money. So now I'm walking thinking I ripped the dude off. I made out. This is birthday presents, Christmas presents. This is when I go out and party. This is when I take my wife. I'm, I'm set. I'm set now. So I go the next day to meet my friend. My friend is a, an entrepreneur, and he's into me sports memorabilia. He has these Michael Jordan basketballs, and he had about three or five of them. I said, dude, man, I'd like one of your Michael Jordans. He said, what do you got to barter with? Psh. I said, I'm in, the biz I'm, in the, I'm in the coat business. Who are you talking about? Come on over to my car. So I go over and I say, pick one of the, true story, pick one of these out. He said, oh, I like this leather one. He picked it out. I said, now, and he gave me the basketball. The next day it rained. I look at the phone. It's him calling me. He said, dude, my arm is all blue because it rained, went through your jacket, and I want my Michael Jordan. I said, why? I said, how did it happen? He said, I ripped open the lining to figure out what it was, and it said PVC plastic. <laughs> it ain't fun to get ripped off. And it's not fun when the deceiver, the devil, comes to rip you off. See, here's what the Bible says very quickly. I just want to read through a few scriptures and just show you Revelations 12:9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, 
And Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Notice he is called the deceiver. He's a master illusionist. He will show you anything that you want to see. So now I'm going to teach you for a few moments how he's able to be so effective in the forms in which he comes. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, for such are false apostles and deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder Satan himself transforms himself as an angel of light. That's why he's able to fool so many people. People that are educated, people that are intelligent, people that have degrees, people that have positions. How is he able to do that? Because he transforms himself as an angel of light. I want you to recognize the devil doesn't deceive anybody with ugly. Now I'm going to put three G's on it. Ugly. 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 Because you, aren't, you are not deceived. You are not tempted by ugly. But if it's fine, oh my God. Jesus. Help me. Help me, Lord. Then it becomes more of... Uh, his deception becomes more real to you, okay? Are you with me? So here we go. Here's how he works. Number one, and I'm going to use this as an example. Now the serpent was more cunning than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat the tree of the garden? If the enemy is the master deceiver, I want you to recognize, once you get in the word of God and you start maturing in your faith, he is absolutely predictable. He's predictable. So he preys on the naive. He preys on the ignorant. He preys on the gullible. He preys on the presumptuous. He preys on the impulsive. And when you take that all out of your life, I'm not impulsive, you say. I don't presume anything. I refuse to be naive and I refuse to be gullible, then you almost take all the weapons away from him. So we go back to, to where he started with the first man and first woman because he's predictable. And if we learn how he dealt with them, we'll be much more wiser. So here we go. The first thing he did with Adam and Eve, or mostly Eve, was he deceived through words. And the enemy will come to you through words. Words that speak to your temptation, word that speaks to your attractions, and words that speak to your vulnerability. Words that are false hopes, erroneous outcomes, fictitious endings, and fraudulent results. He speaks through words of flattery, conceit, arrogance, and haughtiness. Man, you the bomb digging. You all that. You the best of something. And you buy into that thinking you're all that. You are deceived because you're nothing in Christ Jesus. But the way of deception is to flatter you. Let's say some cute little hot mamacita came my way and said, my God, you're the best looking Mexican from, that I've ever seen. How old are you, 25? I said, oh, girl, come on now. My God, you, man, you've been pumping iron or what? You know, and that, that's flattering me. And, and, and it's making me conceited and it's making me haughty. And that, now I'm being deceived. I'm being deceived. How many of you recognize I'm not all that in a bag of chips? <laughs> but that's the way the enemy works to deceive people with words that are attractive to you, words that can flatter you, words that can entice you and provoke you, like gossip, negativity, judgmentalness, or being overly critical, and words that bring scare to you, or terror to you, or frighten you, or make you fearful. He said, hath God said, Hath God said. So it's words. The second thing was when she saw that the fruit was pleasant and desirable for her eyes, she ate of it. The second thing of deception is the appearance. The enemy is going to deceive you with something that's inviting to you, attractive to you, appealing and attentive. Again, he will not deceive most people with ugly because you don't want anything to do with that. Lot is deceived by the attractiveness of Sodom and Gomorrah. David is deceived by the attractiveness of Bathsheba. Achan is deceived by the wealth of Jericho. 
All these individuals were influenced by what they saw. Samson was deceived by Delilah's beauty. Words, appearance. The next thing was, is the deception of how Satan deceived Eve and then Eve influenced Adam. The third word is influence. Influences, you could be influenced by looks and beauty and personality and charisma and status and authority and position and authoritative speech and title and fame. Oh, that person can't be lying to me. That person can't be deceiving to me. Look at how much stature they have. Look at their education. Look at their degrees. Look at their posture. Look at their beauty. Look at how many followers they have. Look at how famous they are. Look at how much money they have. So I want you to recognize you could be deceived by the influence because you want to be liked, the pressure to be liked, the pressure to be accepted, the pressure to fit in. I don't want to be laughed at. I don't want to be left out. The influence. How many of you had a mama like me when you were growing up? And my mama would say something like this. If your friends tell you to jump off the bridge, you finish the sentence. What is that? Are you going to be influenced by your friends? Are you going to be an independent thinker? It's the power of the influence. Everyone's saying it's okay and everyone's doing it. It doesn't make it right, though. It doesn't make it right. And the last word is he will deceive through thoughts. Images in your head, pictures in your head. He'll try to bring questions, doubt, suggestions, opinions, ideas, reasoning, and rationale. He tells the woman, you, you shall not die, forming an image in her mind. I'm not going to die. And these are four ways the enemy is effective. In uh, the late 80s, there was a, a movement, and I'm sure... That, the pastors know about it. There was a man who led a prayer movement and um, he was challenging the body of Christ to pray one hour. It was taken from Matthew 26 where Jesus said, could you not pray with me one hour? And so the challenge was to be able to pray one hour a day. So a lot of churches back then opened up their church, preached on it, taught their people to pray one hour. Well, ours was part of that, the one that I was raised in after I got saved. My responsibility as assistant pastor was to open the church doors at 5 a.m. and host the members as they filtrated through going there to work or school from 5 to 9 o'clock. I did that for more than one year. Start off very innocently on my knees praying, praying with people, watching, everything like that. But as time went on, all of a sudden thoughts came to me. You're the only one praying, Diego. All those lazy people can't get up like you get up at 4 o'clock. Fall on your knees at 5 o'clock. God's giving you revelations. You're a man of God. All those other people who are lazy, they lazy bone people don't pray. That's your pastor's message. Lazy bone people don't pray. And I'm going to, and I recognize, wait a minute. I'm being deceived right now. I'm no greater than anybody else. But it's flattering me right now. It's exalting me right now. It's making myself bigger than I should be. This is not the spirit of God. This is not the voice of God. This is the voice of the devil coming to deceive me. When I first got saved, I had a, uh, and that's why growth tracks and discipleship programs and small groups which you guys thrive in is so essential for when you first get saved so that you could grow up in the kingdom of God and have a, and have a more mature brother and sister in the Lord come alongside of you and you could live an accountable life. Because how many of you know you could be a Christian for 40 years and still be a baby in the Lord? Unless you are discipled, unless you are correctable and accountable. So, so I had a, 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 a brother that was two years older than me and I'd go to him because I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to read my Bible. I didn't know how to do much of anything. And I said, Alex, You know, I gave my life to Jesus and I've committed my life to celibacy and and I won't be having sex anymore and I won't be sleeping around and I won't be doing porn anymore because I love God. But man, God is really cool, Alex, because God gives me sex dreams and and these women come into my dreams and I I have sex with them and so that when I wake up, I'm not tempted anymore because I've already had sex. And he said, bro, 
That ain't God. Let me pray that spirit out of you and cast it out of you right now in the name of Jesus. I know, this will be the last time I'll see you guys because, <laughs> sorry, going back into therapy. That's the subtleness of deception. All, I want you to recognize, where does this deception that we just read lead to in this narrative or in this story? It leads you away from Jesus. It leads you away, what is the devil's objective when he deceives you and deceives mankind? It's to draw them away from Jesus. It's to draw them away from truth. It's to draw them away from this, the word of God, the will of God, and the ways of God. All this deception says, God didn't mean what he said. This Bible isn't true. It was written by man. It's archaic. God didn't really mean that. That's the sign of deception. When it waters down this. Now here's what's very important. Deception always has a measure of truth in it. And that's what fools people. Rat poison is 90% good corn. But it's the 10% strychnine that will kill you. Looks good, sounds good, feels good. They're nice people. They're good people. This is a good person. But I want you to recognize, you, like, like the joker, you are only seeing the 180 side of them. This side is a... So you need to look at a 360 view of people to really understand that. Let me give you an illustration here today. I have a beautiful bowl of fruit. Now in this fruit bowl is real fruit and fake fruit. Now, from you where you're sitting, you can't tell the difference. How many of you, honestly, have ever seen a bowl of fake fruit and reached out and thought it was real and tried to bite into it? Come on, be real right now. Get saved then if you're not going to raise your hand. Come on, be honest. So I want you to recognize, I want you to recognize. So here's a beautiful, delicious apple, okay? Beautiful, delicious apple. Now it feels like an apple, okay? It looks like an apple, but I need to test it a little more. There's no smell to it. Hmm. Let's see. Ah! This is not an apple. The problem is, is we don't test things enough to find if they're real or not. It's got to be real. It looks good. It looks good. It, it feels good. He said he really loves me. He said he's a Christian. He said he'd go to Legacy Church with me. I saw him during worship. I didn't want to make it apparent, but I looked over there, and his hands were lifted up. Thank you, Jesus. You finally sent me a man of God. You don't know where he works. You ain't done a blood test on him. You ain't done a background investigation on him. Can you handle one more? I, I don't know. I, I, we ought to take up another offering if I have to do this again. Deception. Now, how many of you would drink this if the devil was selling it to you? I'm, let's just say you're really thirsty, okay? I mean, you're just, you come from work, you're tired, you just worked out. How many of you would be tempted to drink this if you were really thirsty? I hope, and nobody. Because it says poison on it. And on the back nine, it says strychnine. Mortality rate, zero. Ah, contains acid and radiation in it. How many of you are not tempted by it? You're not, okay? But watch this. I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna relabel poison. And I'm gonna call it sage sin. Because sage is good. <laughs> Spearmint sex. Scotch pine stealing. It's not really stealing because it's scotch pine. <laughs> licorice lust. It's not lust, it's licorice lust. Pambrica pride. It's not pride, it's pambrica. Parsley, listen, parsley porn. 
Parsley is healthy for you. It cleans out your liver. How could it be bad? Peppermint, you'll like this, Fessy. Peppermint, politically correct. Coleander compromise. Black pepper bitterness. It's not real bitterness, unforgiveness. It's black pepper. All spice affair. <laughs> Lemon lime. Now, this is much more attractive for you to drink now because I relabeled it. So I'm going to relabel family. Family is not a husband and a wife. Would you like to drink? See, you want to drink a beer, but I relabeled it. I'm going to relabel abortion. You are not killing a baby. I just relabeled it right in front of you. This is how the enemy is so effective. He takes what truth is, what God said. Thou shall not eat of the tree of, this, of life. The moment you eat of this, you will surely die. Hath God said? Relabel it. Relabel it. So let me see if I could give you a few more thoughts here. The, where this deception leads, again, is to lead you away from truth in recognizing that Adam and Eve lost something, and deception will have you have losses in your life. They lost peace. They lost intimacy with God. They lost God's blessing, God's favor, and had unnecessary difficulties in their lives. Here's what deception looks like. There's no consequences to your actions because there's no hell and there's no punishment and there's no judgment. That's what deception says. Deception says, I think I deserve this or I can get away with this. That's the way deception talks. I don't have to do nothing that I don't want to do. That's the way deception talks. Deception, I'm not hurting anybody by what I do. That's deception. Deception says, listen, I can be a Christian in word. I don't have to be a Christian in lifestyle. How many of you ever heard someone say, show me in the Bible where... You already know they're deceived. Show me in the Bible where I got to go to church. Show me in the Bible where I got to pray. Show me in the Bible where I got to tie. Show me in the Bible where I got to pray. Show me in the Bible where I got to love. Deception. Someone else will do it for me if I don't do it. If I don't tithe or serve or give, somebody else will do it. Deception. You are insignificant because you have a past and you are not gifted to do what God called you to do. No, that's a lie of deception. All of us are disqualified. He's the qualifier in our lives. Deception. I don't have to apologize, repent, or say I'm sorry or ask for help. Yes, you do if you've got problems. Deception. If everyone's believing it and doing it and having it, it can't be wrong. Deception. I love this one. I, you'll, get, Steve, you'll get a kick out of this one. This is one of my favorite. I have a right. I have a right. How many of you know we are the most protesting nation? I have a right. Oh, don't you look at me that way. Oh, you're going to hear from Johnny Cochran, my lawyer. He going to call. I'm raising him from the dead. He going to defend me. <laughs> you don't have no rights in the kingdom of God. That's the problem. You live in a democratic society. So you come in the kingdom of God, which is Christian. And you think, still think like a democratic society. This is a theocracy. You have one God. He's the master and the king. You don't have, I don't have any right to do anything unless I get permission from him. I have a right to cheat on my wife because she cheated on me. I'm going to cheat on, no, sir. No, sir. Did Jesus, did you pray about that? And the Lord said, get even and go out and have an affair. I permit this. No, he didn't do that. But I have a, I have a right. You don't have no rights. You're a Christian. You're a child of God. A few more moments. Here's my last deception. Don't get involved in nothing. Stay passive. Stay neutral. Don't speak out. 
just kind of go with the flow. I know this church can't be that way. It's the way of deception. It's the way of deception. So I want to end right now by giving you a thought. How to deceive proof your life. How to deceive proof your life. Let's take it for 1 John. I alluded to it. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. Test it. Test it. This is how you deceive proof yourself. The Bible. Receive the word of God. Renew your mind on the word of God. Revisit the word of God regularly every day. Remind yourself what the Bible says and remain in the word of God, truth, the will and ways of God until you go home to be with Jesus. If you have the word abiding in your life, you probably will not be deceived because this truth is the glasses that allows you to see. It's your your x-ray vision. Number two, reject non-truth when it comes your way. Don't watch it, don't listen to it, don't permit it, and call it out. So when you hear a non-truth, that is a falsehood. That is not what the word of God says. That's what, what truth says. Call it out for yourself and for the sake of others. Depend upon the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. His voices, his nudges and impressions. I'm hearing what you're saying, but something in me says something ain't right. You look the part, you sound the part, you seem to know what to say, but I got to check here. Something wrong, ain't wrong, something wrong here. And the last thing is be accountable. Be accountable because we all have blind spots. And so go to someone more mature than you and submit your life and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Sometimes you need somebody to come along and speak truth to you that you can't see because you're being persuaded and you're being deceived. Father, I thank you for the message today and I pray it falls where it needed to fall. And I thank you today, oh God, that this church and those that are watching us from Edgewood to all the other people around this world, we will not fall to deception in these last days. We will not be misled. We will not be beguiled. We will not be falling away, oh God. I thank you today, oh God, that we will not be deceived because the word of God abides in us today. And we recognize how the enemy will influence with words. He'll influence by persuasion and appearance and influence and thoughts. Father, in the name of Jesus, what your word says is the standard of our lives, whether we like it or not. Thank you for keeping us from not being deceived in this hour, no matter what anyone says or no matter what is going on, God, we will not be deceived in Jesus' name. I'm gonna ask that nobody move if you still remain in your seat just for a few more moments. Here's what I know. You and I are one germ, one virus, one accident or mishap away from heaven's gate or hell's doors. Tomorrow is not promised to any single one of us. People that die are not 95-year-old people expected to die in hospices. I'm sorry to say because I'm a pastor of a large church, we get phone calls that week of people we saw on Sunday that were in perfect health. Some of them were 18, some of them were 30, some of them were 45, some of them were 65. But here's how it usually goes down. And I'm not saying this to put fear into your life or to wish bad things upon you. I'm only speaking reality today. People get on highways 40 and they never get off because they fall asleep at the wheel because they work two shifts or a drunk driver comes and smashes into them or they go in for minor surgeries. There's not going to be any complications, but they can't revive and the doctors and nurses don't know what happened. Or people do something they've done a thousand times. There's no risk, but this time an accident happens and it severs and cuts and hurts. I just simply want you to be ready, whether it's tonight or a hundred years from now, I'm ready to go to heaven. There ain't no mystery. There ain't no uncertainty. There ain't no wishing. There ain't no hoping. I've made my reservation. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Or you say, without a shadow of a doubt, I'm a Christian, but I'm riding the fence of compromise. In and out, hot and cold. I don't need anyone else to tell me how I'm living is wrong. I know how I'm living is wrong. 
God never left me, but I've wandered away from him. And I just want to come back tonight. You're in a friendly environment and nobody will judge you. And this is what legacy prides itself on right now. People coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So whether you're watching me online or you're in this building, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three, and I'm going to pow and hit my hand. And I just want you to raise your hand as a sign I surrender. I want to go to heaven. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Or I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. One, two, one, two, three. Raise your hand wherever you are, all across this auditorium. There we go. Raise it up high. Raise it up high. You can put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to lead everyone else to join in. But I want you to mean it from your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you more than just as a savior, but as the Lord of my life. I surrender everything to you, good, bad, or indifferent. You've seen it all. But today, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I will never be the same. Now give me the strength to live for you, and I will never go back to where I was. Amen. God bless you. Love your legacy. Thank you so much. Come on, we're thankful tonight, church.